Hello all, welcome. My name is uh, Bülent Taşdelen. I am working as uh, business development manager at Kisser Group. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, data acquisition and, and how to interpret your results while making cutting force uh, analysis and measurements. Uh, I hope that at the end of the webinar you will uh, be able to improve your, your measurement, measurement chain uh, and also uh, uh, get some hints about how to interpret the results. Let's start. I have divided the uh, presentation into mainly two topics, uh, data acquisition, I will start with that and then we will go and uh, look to how we can interpret the results by giving some uh, some case uh, cases where and, and references. Let's start with the data acquisition. And we will start with the with the choosing the right measurement range and it depends on certain things. Uh, in the second chapter, I will uh, introduce the, uh, the effect of alliance, how to utilize alliance filter or correct low pass filter to avoid, to avoid the alliance. Uh, and then at the end, talk a little bit about the how to choose the sampling rate. Let's start with the first topic, how we can choose the right measurement range. And that depends on two things. Uh, the first thing we should consider is that uh, before we, we start to, to set up our system, what are the specific frequencies to capture during cutting force measurements, right? So depending on milling, grinding or turning, we are working with different machine dynamics and process dynamics. So we have the rotational per minute of the workpieces, RPM of workpieces. You have the RPM of the tools. You have the later on the cutting edge passing frequency. So imagine you have a tool, a milling tool, you have four cutting edges. You have a certain RPM, so your cutting edge passing frequency is then, at this specific case, four times your RPM, right? Chip formation frequency, um, how often the chip uh, occurs. So there are different ways, of course, uh, to calculate this. You can collect chips and, and measure the length. And since you know the cutting speed and, and, uh, and the speed of the, the chip can be calculated from that, then you can calculate the chip formation frequency. Or you can also look to the contact length on, on your chip side, then you know the length of the, of the, uh, of the contact uh, for each chip, then you can also calculate the chip formation frequency. Lamel building, so lamels are the deformation bands that, that occurs uh, in the shear plane. And it's of course being affected by the type of the material, the process data, the coolants that we are using and so on. So that is also a way to understand the process and to understand the machinability of, of, of that material and, and why certain types of wear occurs in our tools. Any microstructural properties can be captured. Um, I will give some examples from, from a researcher that has managed the, to, to see certain constituents of, of the microstructure. Chatters, of course, uh, um, cutting um, forces consist of also, also of, of course, the effects from, uh, from the any vibration coming from the machine or the spindle um, or the linear moving axis or the process um, excited and so on. So, so that effect can be also captured in cutting force measurements. Resonance of the machine parts um, can come from your machine constructional uh, parts like ball screws, spindles, tables, gear systems that you have in our spindles. Any disturbances that may come from external equipment, especially for, from coolant pumps. And of course, um, um, also, when you start analyzing, and if you have certain conditions and 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 certain uh, uh, the signature of the process and machine, uh, you can still capture part of those properties in your cutting force measurement. So, when we know which which kind of frequencies am I expecting in my uh, process uh, to make the measurement on, now it is time to have a look if we can measure those frequencies with uh, the measurement chain that we have. And the first step, as I said before, we need to check the product information of the hardware and software. 
is if, if there is limitations uh, when it comes to the maximum frequencies. And uh, the second step is to have a look what is the nature frequency of the sensor itself when integrated in the structure, because that will be a limitation factor. If you have a look on the frequency response function of uh, a sensor system, in this case, one of our dynamometers, you can see here that uh, uh, there is a distinct spike at certain frequencies, and that is what we call the natural frequency of that uh, sensor itself. So you can see that there is a uh, phase shift. So, and if we make the presentation uh, of this as a general rule, you can see that uh, frequency response function. So you have frequencies in x-axis. You have the magnitude um, of the of that system. You can see this distinct spike at certain frequency that what we call natural frequency f0 and what we say is is that uh, the maximum frequency that you can capture with such a system having a natural frequency of f0 here it's somewhere between one fifth and one third of this uh, of this of this natural frequency and of course later on uh, let us say in this case, the maximum frequency that you can capture with such a system if the one third of it. This is where you put your low pass filter. How to find out the natural frequencies of the dynamometers, for instance? You can be in different ways. If, if, if you have an accelerometer, then you can uh, place that on, uh, uh, if, if it's milling or grinding, turning, doesn't matter where the chip will occur. Yeah. Uh, close to that point and, and then um, uh, excite uh, uh, the system yeah and you can do it in different ways um, you can simply make a gentle heat on the dynamometer with an allen key you, so you can use your the dynamometer itself also to 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 calculate or to measure the nature frequency with an allen key as i said or a plastic hammer and you are making the measurement in the time domain as you can see here so Later on, you need to transform this measurement into the frequency domain, and you can also do that uh, with our DynaWare software. As you can see here, now we have converted this, so we have certain frequencies, the nature frequencies of the system, represented here with the red uh, areas here. Uh, so this means that our uh, system has a natural frequency uh, at, that, at, those, at that frequency, as you can see here. And of course, this is also indicating that if you are using certain RPMs and certain um, toolpath passing frequencies and so on, you should avoid to be close to those frequencies. Otherwise, you will excite that and you will be measuring that. Um, so after talking a little bit about some limitations that can come from the hardware or software or the dynamometer in this case, as presented or the sensor itself, let's look to the alliance and uh, how to avoid and, and, uh, and how to set up um, uh, a, 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 a the right filtering strategy. Uh, let's start by explaining a little bit about that acquisition. As you can see here, a physical happening in, in a true signal is then, uh, as you can see, it's in a sinus uh, form. Uh, you can see those rectangular meshed here, you see here, uh, and the horizontal resolution is actually the, the, the time difference, the time passes between each sampling. Yeah? So we are trying to make a sampling and, and the time passes is this horizontal part of the rectangular. The vertical part, the vertical re resolution is the bit width. Yeah? And those are properties of your data acquisition system or your AD conversion. Yeah? So sampling rate, it can be presented as sample per second or also hertz yeah but it, it is it is a, a properties of how how fast you are sampling um, for instance if you now we start looking to the, the difference between uh, higher and lower bits as you can see here um, and and frequency happening in a sinus form if you have a 14 bit uh, you have this red curve here uh, but if you have a three bit, as you can see, the vertical re resolution is lower, uh, th that it will cause steps. So your accuracy will not be as good as, as the 14 bit. If you now talk about the sampling interval, uh, as I said before, 
um, the sampling interval is, is the time and that passes between two sampling points and, and the inversion of it, of course, the frequency, the sampling frequency. As you can see here, uh, the red curve is, is the, tr the true signal and, and the blue dots are my sampling. So if you, of course, if you improve the amount of the blue uh, dots here, then you will get a better resolution also. Let's uh, look to this example. Again, a sinus a wave here that occurs at 100 hertz. Yeah, this blue vertical line here. And we are sampling with 1000 sample per second. So 1000 hertz, this means 10 times. So we are up here. So this means that one true complete signal will consist of 10 sampling yeah, points. And this is what you, you can see here. So we have 10 of them. It means that uh, the stored signal will be correct. So we are sampling 10 times uh, of the, the true happening here. So we have the right uh, capture representation of that uh, the true signal. If you look to this example, then we have uh, uh, 900 hertz instead. Yeah, and we are sampling only with 1000 sample per second. So 1000 hertz. So if you look here, we have 900 hertz and then we are sampling with 1000. So it's very close to, to that. So it means that uh, that uh, we will have, as you can see here, 10 times happening in this uh, representation here. And this means that the sign of the stored signal will be uh, much different compared to the true signal. And what we are actually measuring here is the difference between, as you can see, the, the true signal and my sampling rate. So 1000 minus 900, 100 hertz. So now we are measuring 100 hertz only. So that's why uh, we need to apply at least the Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem. And it says that the sampling frequency has to be at least two times the maximum frequency that you want to measure. That's what Nikos Shannon says, otherwise you will have an analyzing, so you will measure false frequencies and I will, I will explain this. So it means that if you have a true signal that you want to measure, your sampling rate should be at least two times uh, bigger than that. So you should not be, uh, your maximum frequency range should not be in this red region here. If you are there, then you will be measuring the difference between your the, the, act, the true signal and your sampling rate, as you can see here, because you don't fulfill the Nyquist condition. As I said before, what you're going to measure is, is the difference between the, the true signal and the sampling frequency, if you don't fulfill the Nyquist condition. So let's uh, have a look to this uh, system, as you can see here. Uh, this is a true happening in one of our machining operation. Uh, we have certain frequencies, uh, as you can see, 25, 70, 160, and 510, and maybe some frequencies between. And what we do is that we choose a sampling frequency that is 100. Yeah. So um, what will happen is that uh, since we have the sampling rate, 100 hertz, which is not really uh, high enough. Um, you remember the maximum frequency uh, that is here is 510 and we need to have at least two times, but we are at 100. So what we will be measuring is, uh, is for instance, the difference between 170 as the 30, as you can see here, 30 hertz here. We will be measuring, um, you can see there's another frequency, 160 here. So uh, the second harmonic of sampling frequency rate, 100 is 200. So we will be measuring 200 minus 160, 40, and the same 500, and the difference between 500 and the 510, and that is 10, uh, 10 hertz. So we have those aliasing terms coming in. Uh, since we have a sampling frequency which is high enough and we will be measuring those frequencies which are actually false frequencies. Let's look to this system where, as you can see uh, on the left hand side, uh, how we can avoid uh, um, uh, anti-aliasing uh, with the anti-aliasing filter. 
Uh, as you can see here, we have a sensor system, and then later we have a signal conditioner, and then we have a data acquisition, and then we may have post-processing analysis. So, and, and we have some true happenings, uh, physical things that happens at certain frequencies represented with uh, blue lines here. And then we are actually interested in, in this frequency range, as you can see here. We have a bandwidth of the conditioner, which is um, going up to higher frequencies. Yeah. So on the left-hand side, we don't use any filtering. On the right-hand side, we are using a low-pass filter because we say that we are interested in this region. So we put, we put a low-pass filter um, and that will uh, act as an anti-aliasing. Yeah? So we are not getting the higher frequencies in this, in this case. And then we choose a sampling rate, as you can see here. The same thing on the right-hand side, sampling frequency here. On the right-hand side, since we have used a low-pass filter during signal conditioning, um, and that sampling rate is at least two times bigger than what we are measuring, then we will have an alias-free data. But as explained before, in this left-hand side, since we have not used any filter and we don't have any uh, anti-aliasing filter either in, in our data acquisition system, what we will be measuring are the false frequencies. And some researchers make uh, filtering after getting acquiring the data, but it will be too late because even if you even if you put your low pass filter where you are interested in, you will still be seeing those false frequencies that are actually not existing in your system. So one way was low pass filter like we have on the right hand side to avoid aliasing. And the other way is, of course, to have anti-aliasing filters. Some of the, um, uh, the data acquisition systems, they have automatic anti-aliasing filters. And with the help of that, then you will be measuring the right frequency. So then if you look to our, uh, for instance, DynaWare, when we are setting up with the LabM, um, in this case, we have eight channels that, that, uh, that you, you can see. We will label them. Um, after what is set in our data sheet for a specific dynamometer, eight channels. Later on, we also look to the calibration sheet. We need to put the sensitivity and the measurement range that we are interested in yeah, for each channel. And then uh, later on, as I said before, we need to use the, the filter, the low pass filter already while, while we are acquiring the data in this case. yeah. Otherwise, we will have an aliasing effect. The time constant for quasi static measurements, which cutting force is, uh, is long. So you need to choose long. So uh, now we uh, talk about a little bit uh, data acquisition. I hope that it will help you to improve your settings. And now uh, the main question arises often how to imp interpret our data. And of course, uh, this depends a lot on which kind of operation you are using, what kind of machines you have, how much energy and, and time you have put and, and, and knowledge you have about your machines. That I ex explained in, uh, in the milling and turning webinar that, for instance, with, with a simple accelerometer, you can go and measure certain what kind of frequencies are coming from different parts like linear moving heads and spindles and coulomb pumps and so on. When you put them all together, it will be much easier, of course, to interpret your data, which will be still specific, but the, I will try to give some examples uh, and hopefully they can, those examples can, can help uh, in your case also. If you look to a cutting, a cutting force measurement, uh, so in regards of this turning, milling, or, 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 or grinding, or even uh, drilling, you have different uh, force components. Let us, in this case, look to three force components. We have feed force, passive force, cutting force. As you can see here, we have static part of the force, uh, force measurement. So uh, in this case, it seems to be quite uh, constant, but with the tool where we can, we know that it can have tops and valleys, it can have some slopes going up and going down and so on, yeah? But that is the static part of the force components. Then we have a dynamic part, yeah? And later on, of course, then we also have the ratios between the, the force components. So, so if you are working with understanding and making research on cutting forces, you need to uh, consider and, and, and look to those, uh, those three properties of a cutting force measurement. 
The first sign that consists of chip, the information from chip, chip how, how the chip formation occurs, toolware and toolware type, surface quality that depends, yeah, dimension and roughness. So if you can especially find the correlation between the, the dynamic part, for instance, uh, and the surface roughness, you can use also a force measurement to some sort of make an indirect control of your quality, yeah? which can be used in R&D to build models and correlations, but even in production, uh, you can use that knowledge when you know that correlation uh, to a certain part quality parameter, then you can use it as an indirect um, indirect uh, quality measurement and thus decrease the amount of quality measurements that, that, that you are spending in your, in your operation. Of course, uh, if you have some imbalances of the spindle and work systems, you will have different dynamic part. If you have interrupted, interrupted cuts, which I will also show one, one case, you, you, will, you will see that uh, in both static and dynamic part. If you have out of roundness and workplace, that is a little bit uh, affecting also. It will cause an imbalance and, and, and also high dynamic. Microstructural effect, I will show an example from a researcher from uh, UK where, uh, where you could see the different um, effect of the different part of the microstructure uh, in the force measurement. Of course, as I said uh, um, before the slide, that if you have certain properties of your ma machine, mechanical and electrical configuration, um, like stiffness and damping, which affect the deflection of your system, you will see uh, that effect also on your core cutting force measurement. And also, sometimes when you have external forces that is also affecting like coolants and oscillations from external equipment, such as pumps and robots and so on. Let's look to this, uh, this example. It is from Mehdi Ainian here and Professor Yusuf Altentash, where they work with uh, the chatter stability in milling. Um, some of you are familiar with such plots. They are called stability loops, um, where you have the force, and that is represented often with depth of cut or feeds. And then you have frequency domain, where you have spindle speeds, rotational speeds, and so on. So you have some stability loops, meaning that Below the, this red curve, you have stable process, but over uh, that curve, you have unstable. So then if you look to this, uh, this part here, the force measurement, when you are measuring when, when the forces while making the machining operation at certain cutting condition, you will have stable conditions. So you will have a, a typical noise level or dynamic, so to say, in milling. But if you are in the unstable regions, then you will have, uh, you will see the chatter. So then, of course, you have a wide spectra of, 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 of the representations between these two. So this means that when you look to a force measurement, you also see the indications of, of oscillation starting up or, or heavy oscillations. Yeah. So noise of your, your or the dynamic part of your, your force measurement uh, can give hints about the chatter and, and oscillations and so on. Then let's talk, talk about a little bit stiffness and deflection. And uh, I will give an example how to correlate force measurement to actually deflection, both dynamic and static deflection. Let's start with this example. You have an CNC machine or robot. As you can see, we have different, you have a di drive with scales that run this according to your coordinates and feeds that you, you, you have a program. You have different type of interfaces here. You have your, your tool here, cutting tool. It can be turning tool. It can be milling tool. It can be drilling. It can be a grinding wheel. It can be honing stone. Doesn't matter. You have different type of interfaces. And of course, this is a mechanical structure. We did not, uh, it's not an infinite stiffness. So, so this means that you are deflecting and, and the more joints you have, of course, the more deflection that you will have in your total deflection. So when you have cutting forces in three directions, you will have a delta D deflection in also three directions, right? And these deflections, they will cause alterations. So it means that if the tool is being deflected from the center to the, this, uh, this um, inclined uh, line here, this means that you are not really following the coordinates that you have you have programmed for, so it will affect your yeah, your surface uh, because of the, 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 the deflections. So 
a way to measure the deflections is actually to be able to know and measure the stiffness of your system. And that you can do with the help of a force and displacement sensor. So if you are measuring force in some sort of like a setup, uh, setup uh, step before you make the machining, if you place a displacement sensor on the other side while you are uh, pushing against your workpiece or your grinding wheel and measuring the force, then you will be plotting the force versus deflection. And the inclination, the slope, is actually the stiffness of your system. So then you know your system, how much it deflects for each nifton, yeah? how many micron it deflects. And of course, this means that later on, if you, while later on you are making the machining operation, you have cutting forces. Those cutting forces, if you looked at to that, uh, that measurement, you are actually, if you multiply that signal with the uh, stiffness value, yeah, so the inversion of one over stiffness, if you multiply it with the force, you are actually looking to the deflection. Yeah, so this is a way to measure the deflection, and that is, of course, affecting your, your uh, surface properties. And that is being used and represented in this in this patent, an old patent. Uh, if you look to, to the force measurement here, as you can see, it's a force in Nifton during the time scale. And when you take this take this part in turning operation and measure the straightness, how straight you are cutting, that is called profile accuracy, you can see that they are resembling a lot. And that is because the turning tool, because of the force, is being deflected outwards in this case, and that will also leave imperfections on your surface. And in this case, the owner of these patents, they have used this in order to improve the, uh, the straightness to profile accuracy. So they connect the force signal to the machine. As you can see here, when they have the force control during chip formation, they are changing different settings of the, of the cutting speeds and, and feeds and, and so on they are cutting much straighter compared to not having force control where you have uh, the effect of the deflection because you have some uh, different depth of cuts uh, due to the, uh, to, the, to the imperfections coming from the pre-operation. Yeah. So as you can see, when you look to the, especially the statical part of your force during turning operation, for instance, or during um, um, uh, creep grinding, for instance, yeah, then you will see that, uh, that, that there is an effect of the deflection on your part. Let's look to a uh, milling tool now in this case. Uh, face milling, we have four uh, inserts and um, yeah, we look to a torque uh, uh, measurement. If you can zoom to that measurement, you will see that you can really see uh, the moment distribution around each insert, yeah, and that can also be seen with the also the polar diagram, yeah, uh, by utilizing our software DynoWare, for instance, you can see the torque level on each edge, and that is also, uh, as you can see, uh, thanks to the, this, this uh, dynamic part of the of the measurement with the piezo technology, you can really see uh, the moment on each insert, yeah, and. Um, and by, by analyzing these, then, then you can get ideas about if any unbalance wear occurs on one of the inserts, um, or if, I, if you have any big run out on your tool and so on. Yeah. Another example is from Suarez Fernandez here, a work done in UK, uh, where face turning, while doing the face turning, cutting forces are measured, as you can see here. And in order to find the start and exit of the each rotation a slot was made here so cutting forces are measured and afterwards uh, the surface is also um, etched and, and the material the microstructure is analyzed um, and if you look to the force measurement the dynamic part of the edge measurement is you can see those small spikes because of the slots so you have one rotation and these researchers, they have uh, put those uh, rotations um, in, an, in an, as you can see, as a round uh, representation, but by putting them um, one another uh, um, after each other, um, and, and then analyzing the, uh, the dynamic part in, um, as you can see, with different colors, topographical representation, they can see the correlation of the forces 
and and the microstructure certain certain grains that they have in the microstructure yeah so so this dynamic part of your system of course depends on on the, on the material that that you are measuring yeah you are machining bar formation and forces in drilling operations uh, it's often um, uh, being uh, re made researched on as you can see these plots they are um, force measurements done with the dynamometer here and where you measure the forces and, and, and the moment. As you can see here, when you, and this work is being done by Mehdi Ainian here. Um, and as you can see here, um, the, uh, uh, when the wear is low, um, at the exit of the force level, you have certain noise, for certain dynamic. Uh, when, and when the wear uh, goes up, this this level goes uh, also up, and that is because you have this correlation between uh, between the noise level and and the bar formation in drilling operation. Another part is is uh, from turning, um, where uh, if you are working with uh, with, for instance, evaluating in this case. Um, um, different phenomena in cheap contact like contact land and uh, cheap up curling or you would like to see the effect of any uh, coolant or lubricants for instance in this case and uh, the, the turning operation started to dry and in the middle and uh, the mql minimum quantity lubrication which is applied externally to the insert has been switched on while measuring the cutting forces and you can see that there is a slight um, uh, effect because of this MQL. And that is also being seen in, in uh, the chip formation. So if you look to the chip up curling radius, you have a little bit smaller radius with the MQL compared to, to, to dry operation. So, so what you are doing is that you, you are, when you look to that, that small difference, uh, in the forces, it is indicating uh, any any difference in chip up curling and contact length in this case. Um, then we, we, I also mentioned about these ratios of the forces, correlation to friction. As you may know, it is being used in honing, in grinding, uh, in turning operation. Um, and in certain milling operations, it is also being this correlation is also being used uh, to build models to understand machinability and so on and so on. Um, especially the correlation between the feed force and cutting force. Yeah. But in our models, we often measure cutting force and we measure feed force. We divide them because that is the the the, the, the friction. But this is not uh, exactly the right way. There is another uh, procedure to, 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 to make it more, uh, more right uh, because we need to uh, distinguish when we look at a force measurement, cutting force measurement, we need to distinguish the forces coming from the clearance side and coming from the rake side of, of a turning operation. And in order to, to, to do that, we need to follow a special procedure. Uh, so what can be done uh, is that uh, the chip thickness can be increased uh, during turning operation so you start with a warm-up around 10 seconds a turning operation then you decrease the your, your chip thickness to very low values and then uh, step by step increasing to high levels yeah and the reason we do is that we would like to plot cutting force so cutting force and feed force against the chip thickness yeah and when those points it, it, this is quite linear when they interact and intersect the y axis here when the, there is no chip thickness you still have a force yeah and those forces as you can see here those forces are the forces acting purely on the clearing side as represented here cl clearing side so the cutting force and the feed force they have uh, components from the rake phase and the clearing phase and and this is, is a methodology to distinguish these two yeah and then of course by by um, using the angles on the rake and on the clearing side you can uh, calculate the pure friction on the rake face of the uh, of your um, of your of your cutting uh, experiment yeah and this of course can be used as i said to improve your models uh, to understand the machinability 
behaviors of different materials and also, of course, to understand the effect of any coolant or lubricants that you may have in your process. Yeah. So we talk about the dynamic part, we talk about the static part of the cutting forces, but of course, uh, the ratio is also being, as I said, being also used in, in different type of operations. And this is a, just a methodology proposal to, to distinguish uh, and, 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 and use right friction uh, coefficient. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, for your um, your um, attention, and I hope that this webinar will help you. If you have questions, you can uh, contact your local Kistler uh, representative in your country, or or contact me also. Thanks a lot. Thank you.